God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of our praise, and to you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. As we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of our praise. And to you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. So we sing holy. Holy. Holy.
Can we make that our desire? God, it's my desire. I want to know you more. I want to know you better. Hallelujah. God, I love you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, Man, I'm happy to be in God's house. How about you? Thank the Lord. And i tell you what, why don't we just take three or four minutes and walk around, talk to somebody you haven't talked to tonight, and uh, ask them how they're doing. Amen. Take just a moment and we'll dig into the word of the Lord.
Hallelujah. Well, all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Hey, when we're on top of our game, we finish our first song before 7.30. <laughs> I totally dismissed prayer and they got up here to sing at 7.25. We had to go live early. <laughs> Nobody can accuse us of being late tonight. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Well, glory. Hey, Anybody happy? Hey, Amen. Well, we ought to be happy because we are $59 and... 24 cents shy of $34,000 in our building fund. Hallelujah. Amen. How's that up for a little bit of math on the fly? <laughs> we at this very moment right now have $33,940.76 in the building fund. Amen. And the best is yet to come. And praise God, we got chairs on the way and still didn't have to touch our building fund. Amen. Well, glory. You know, we're going to, I tell you what, y'all can be seated. And uh, just give me a little gravy until we read the scriptures. <laughs> you know, they tell me. They tell me that uh, there's two things the pastor's never supposed to talk about. And uh, the first one's money. And the second one's the family. <laughs> so I'm in deep because the other night I taught about both of them. <laughs> Amen. But we're going to dig in tonight. We're going to go a little bit further in the series. And um, how many of you now... You can be honest. You won't hurt. You probably will hurt my feelings if you're honest, but that's okay. <laughs> How many of you has been enjoying this this series on the family? Man, I I am enjoying it, but it is definitely the most challenging, um, personally challenging in a plethora of ways, uh, lesson or session of series of lessons that I've ever taught. But, amen, God's helping us. You know, I, I think because so many preachers are scared to talk about it, there's a hunger in our churches to really know what does the Bible say about my family. And, um, and so we're going to do that. And, uh, hey, we ought to give a hand clap of appreciation for Pro Presenter. Amen. And Brother Oscar. We're going to work tonight, and Lord willing, all the scriptures in my notes will be on the screen. Lord willing. And uh, at least I, I gave him all of them, but if the computer decides to malfunction, well, we, won't, we will not blame you, Brother Oscar. <laughs> Y'all can't even see him back here, but he's smiling. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're having a good time. Looking forward to Sunday. We're going to have Brother Shub preaching for us. And it's going to be incredible. Amen. Amen. Well, stay seated. Because tonight we're going we're gonna to eat a good home-cooked meal. And uh, you, you, you eat better sitting down. And I have 11 verses to read. So <laughs> just have you remain seated. But we're going to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians, chapter number 5. And we're going to start at verse 22. Yeah, you can put it up, brother. Is it working? All right, cool. We'll follow along together. Ephesians, chapter number 5. 
verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, not somebody else's husband, your own, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, everybody say Christ, Christ. is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify, everybody say sanctify, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it, the church, should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth it and ch- nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the lord the church For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. They too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, Let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her own, her husband. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk from this topic, the role of the husband. The role of the husband. Thank you, Brother Butler. God bless you. You can find somewhere to sit. (laughs) This is the fifth series. And this series, a biblical view of the family. A biblical view of the family. The first lesson in this series dealt with the preeminence of the Word of God in life. The second lesson was the purpose of the family. The third lesson was about God's provision for the family. Last week we talked about headship in the family or a biblical study of headship. And last week we covered how that headship is about source and responsibility. When the wife and kids are submitted to the husband and the husband is submitted to God and God's representatives, then God takes care of the issues of the family. We talked about last week how that if my family is having financial trouble, but I am submitted to God, then I can go in prayer to God and say, God, you are my head. It also means lordship, so i got to be paying my tithes, by the way. But if I'm paying my tithes and I'm submitted to God, and my family's having financial problems, headship determines that when I have issues, I can go to God and say, God, your family has issues. And because headship is about source and responsibility, then God is required by His own word. To intervene and take care of the situation however he sees fit. 
But tonight we're going to hone in and we're going to pinpoint with accuracy on the role of the husband primarily in the marriage relationship. The role of the husband primarily in the marriage relationship. Now listen, sisters, I'm going to teach about you next week. So give us a little grace between now and next Friday. Because <laughs> I'm going to dig in to the nitty gritty with the husbands. But now don't be like, now Pastor Hilton said. <laughs> I'm teaching, teaching about your role next week. All right. So let's. <laughs> hey, hey, we got to have fun tonight or this won't work. All right. My wife's going to be like, now you said. <laughs> Well, so let's go as we start this lesson tonight on the role of the husband. Let's go to Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 27. Now we've seen this verse, we've read this verse probably almost every single week that we've been in this series. So hey, why not read it again? Genesis chapter 1 verse number 27. So God created man... In his own image. Everybody say image. image. In the image of God created he him. Everybody say him. him. Male and female created he them. Notice there is a stair step. There is a order. He created him. And then he goes on to say male and female created he them. God created Adam like God. You can just leave that on the screen for now. God created Adam like God. But Adam was not God. This is an obvious fact. However, it presents a, a poignant issue. Husbands and fathers are like God. But brothers, you ain't God. I ain't God. <laughs> so the fact that he created us in his image and created us like him, but we are not him, limits the authority of the man within the home. The stream of his authority flows within the levees of God's law. We are confined to what the Bible says about us. Our authority, brothers, is confined to what is written in the book about us. Does that make sense? Because we're not God. We are not the supreme authority. We're, we're not, um, we, we don't make our own rules. We, we have authority given to us, designated to us, delegated to us by what's written in this book. This means that everything that man is and has is derived from God and is contingent upon God's grace. So this means that the man cannot represent himself. The man represents God to the family. If we're going to be what God wants us to be, if our families are going to be what... God wants them to be, then, then brothers, we have to realize, and sisters, you have to realize, and, and the kids have to realize that, that we represent, and this is a multiple faceted statement, but that we represent God to our family. That limits our authority, but it also gives us authority. It limits what we, what we can do, but it also gives us the ability to do what God's called us to do. So man represents God to the family. The husband is God's agent in the home. The husband is God's agent in the home. The husband reveals the likeness of God to his family. Brothers, this is why we got to do it right. We got to be right with God. Because 
Think about this. When somebody has trouble understanding the Father's love, oftentimes and most times, we can point back to the fact that they didn't have a Father to show them love. And so brothers, how you treat your family determines how they're going to view God. How you are the father to your children determines how your children are going to view God. The biggest problem in our society today is sin, but the second biggest problem in our society today is the lack of husbands and fathers in the family. Because when daddy's not present, When the delegated representative from heaven is not present in the home, it all falls to pieces. And so man is God's agent in the home. Now, the second thing we need to recognize from this is that when God created Adam, Adam was created mature, Physically in every way. However, Adam was immature spiritually and emotionally. Well, how can you make that statement, Pastor? Because we know that the first man was innocent and unschooled. He had a lot of learning to do. So Adam was full grown with a lot of growing to do. This is why, this is why God forbid him at the moment from partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because he wasn't mature enough emotionally and mentally and spiritually to be able to absorb that knowledge. This is why when it's the same concept. When you're raising your kids and they're five, six, and seven, you don't give them the birds and the bees talk. Because they're not mature enough to have that knowledge. Well, actually in 2020 it might be. But I'm guarding my kids, so hopefully I don't have to have it for a few more years. It's the same concept. So Adam's planted in the garden. God, I don't believe that God intended Adam to never partake of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He he just couldn't partake in it at the beginning because he wasn't spiritually and emotionally mature enough to partake in it. If God didn't intend for him to partake of it, then why did he put it in the garden? He just told him, you got to mature enough. To be able to obey me. And when I know that you'll trust me and do everything I say. There's going to come a time where you'll be mature enough that I'll allow you to partake of this. Partaking of the tree. The tree itself wasn't sin. It was the disobedience that was the sin. So Adam was not mature enough. So now let's not get caught up in the brambles there. But let us make an observation. What does this mean? This means when, when your husband stood there watching you walk down the aisle on your wedding day, he was the very image of God when he said, I do to your family, but he had a whole lot of growing up to do. <laughs> the man is the image of God in the home from the start, even though he isn't perfect. Everybody with me? The man has to grow into the office. That gives me hope because you know what? Quite frankly, nine and a half years into this, I'm royally messing up every week. (laughs) And this series is convicting the you know what out of me. (laughs) I'm hoping I can be a good husband by the time I reach February. (laughs) The deal is, 
Sisters, your husband doesn't know everything and he never will, no matter what he says. But that doesn't mean that he's not the image of God to your home. If leadership was based, if qualification for leadership was based on perfection, then we're all doomed. So what this lets us know is God creates Adam, puts him in the home, and says, now you got to grow. And husbands, our responsibility, brothers, our responsibility is that we've got to continually try to improve and learn and better ourselves. Now, I'm preaching to me right now, not any of you, but... But what I have to do is I have to, I'm nine and a half years into this married thing and I'm realizing I haven't done a very good job of figuring out and learning about my wife. See, this doesn't just talk about us learning what the role is. It's about learning your wife as well. So we are the image of God to our family, even though we're imperfect. You carry that role because of the office. Everybody doing okay? All right, now let's go to Genesis chapter number three and verse number 16. This verse appears in the passage in your Bible. If it, if it has subheadings in your scripture, it's probably deemed the curse. This is after the fall of man. This is God. And, and, and this is God speaking here, and he's pronouncing judgment upon everything. All right? Uh, and this is just verse 16. We picked up kind of in towards the middle of this, this cursing thing that God did. All right. Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception." In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Now, we're not going to talk about any of that tonight. We're going to talk about that next week. But this last segment of the verse is what I want to focus on tonight. And he shall rule over thee. Now, I want to remind you where this is found. This is found... In the middle of God's cursing. Who is he speaking this to? He is speaking this to fallen humanity. This verse is God describing the penalties for sin upon the woman. I want you to note that this is not God's desired result. But this is the penalty for sin that has been placed upon the woman and the man. And again, we'll talk more about the first part of this verse next week. But this phrase, and he shall rule over me, over thee. Again, listen to me. We got to catch this because I'm going to bring this to a point, not like you think I am. Again, this is in reference. He is talking to fallen Sinful humanity. You with me? He's talking to fallen sinful humanity. This phrase rule over thee means to have dominion and dominate. God was saying here that because of sin, the husband is now going to have a natural, sinful appetite to dominate and rule over his wife. But you listen to me, if we're going to be God's man and, God's, and the husband that God wants us to be and God's image in our family, then we must fight the urge to dominate our wives at every single instance. This was not God giving instruction to man. This was God giving the woman. He's talking to the woman. And he said, this is what's going to happen because of sin. Because of sin, men are going to try to dominate women. But you listen to me. Brothers, if we're going to be what God's called us to be, it is not the will of God for us to give in to sin and to dominate women. 
This is not the plan of God. This was the curse that was instituted by sin. He was saying it's going to be natural inside of a man to want to rule the woman and dominate her. And I think it goes back to because she's the one that instigated it. And I don't know. I don't understand all those dynamics. But but listen to me. Listen to me. If brothers, if you are, and hopefully none of you are, and I don't think any of you are. So I'm not preaching anybody here tonight. But if you are dominating your, your wife... You are in sin and you need to repent because that is not the will of God. You are giving in to a sinful fleshly appetite that is not from God and is not pleasing to God. And quite frankly, your wife is going to hate you, despise you, and your marriage is going to go to shambles because this is sin getting in your marriage. The man that dominates and treat his, treats his wife like a slave is a sinful man that's going to go to hell and needs to repent. That's good preaching, Pastor Hilton. Everybody with me? See, here's the deal. You've, you've read that verse and be like, bless God. There it is, right there. It's in Scripture. No, you need to read the rest of the passage. Anything that happened in the curse wasn't the will of God. It was the result of sin. I want to say at the outset of the remaining portion of my lesson... That God is not a fair God. He is just, but He is not fair. I just like feel like I wrecked somebody's theology. God's not a fair God. Well, it's just not fair. Life and God isn't fair. He's just, but He's not fair. Everybody with me? All right. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at the first family that God created, Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Steve, by the way. Throwing that out there. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at the first family that God created as the model of what our families should look and operate like. So we've been viewing... The, the relationship between Adam and Eve, pre-fallen condition, the created state, not after the curse. But tonight we're going to look at another model that Paul identifies that we need to make our families and especially our, our marriages look and operate like. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter number 5. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, we're going to have it on the screen tonight. Praise God. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband, verse 23, is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, Christ, is the savior of the body. Verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. So let the, the wives be to their, husband, their own husbands and everything. In these three verses, we see Paul identify another model that God created that we must model our marriages after. What is that model? It is the model of Christ's relationship with the church. 
Paul is using the model of Christ's relationship with the church as the template for what marriage is supposed to look like. Christ and the church provide the supreme template for marriage. Listen. You need to model your marriages after Jesus and his church. Not after me and my wife. All right? We're going to do our best to be as good of examples as we can be, but I got a long ways to go. It is not possible to define what a healthy marriage actually is. It's not possible to define that apart or without an understanding of the love and submission between the church and Christ. This actually works both ways. Christ and the church... Provide a template for godly marriage. Meaning we should model our marriages after this. Likewise, a godly marriage points people towards Christ and the church. So the Christian home, when a godly marriage is intact, the Christian home becomes a place where family, friends, visitors, and neighbors can come to the home and they can see exactly what Christ and the church look like by the relationship between the husband and the wife. The Christian home should be a place where people from the world that are looking for something better can come to or come in contact with. And just you being there declares the purposes and the image of God at work in real life. And so so we've got a two-way street here. On one hand, we need to model our marriages after Christ and the church. On the other hand, that we shine the light of Christ and the church by our marriages. And that's why when you walk in a restaurant or a place of business, they say there's something different about you. You're walking hand in hand, husband and wife, and your wife is representing the church. And brothers, you are representing Jesus. And together, we're representing the image of God to our city. And together, we're representing the image of God to our community. But it must be noted that God's not a fair God. He's not fair. Because the husband's duty in marriage is much greater than that of his wife. Because of the model that he must reach for. The church. (laughs) I've been in a couple of them. I ain't found a perfect one yet. The church has a lot of issues. The church has a lot of problems. The church has a lot of stuff. The church oftentimes has a lot of questions, a lot of division, a lot of unsettledness, even some insecurities. And the wives model themselves After the church. Jesus. Brothers. Is our model. Jesus. Doesn't have any issues. Jesus. Is perfect. Jesus. Doesn't sin. Jesus. Doesn't fail. Jesus' love never fails. Brothers, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I'm a long way off. God's not fair. Husbands 
Christians are called, listen to me, to love their wives to the same high standard that Jesus loves the church. Obviously, this is impossible to achieve apart from grace. Brothers, we must ponder the weight of the words contained in this passage. And then we must daily, weekly, monthly, as often as we can, hourly fall upon our face and say, God, I need your grace. Because I'm telling you, if, 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 if you think you got your marriage, this marriage thing figured out and you think you got this husband thing figured out, go back and look at Jesus on the cross. And I'm telling you, you know what it makes me do? It makes me find a place to pray and say, God, I need your help. God, I need your grace because without your grace, I'm a miserable failure of a husband. It's a standard of excellence. It's a standard of high reach. It's a standard of high qualifications. And we need the grace and help of God to help us reach that. We're going to read through this passage tonight. And we're going to expose four aspects of godly love. That husbands should, must, if we're going to be like Christ, demonstrate towards our wives. So let's go to number one. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25. If you got your Bibles, you can follow along because we're pretty much going to go verse by verse. We're talking about four aspects or four types of love that husbands must have. For their wives. Type number one. Husbands. Love your wives. Even as Christ. Also loved. The church. And gave himself. For it. The first type of love. Is sacrificial. Love. Christ's love for the church took him to the Garden of Gethsemane, where as a man he began to wrestle with this call of God. And it was that sacrificial love of Christ that caused him at the end of his prayer. To say, God, if there's not another way, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. It was a sacrificial love that caused him to, to battle with his flesh in the garden. It was sacrificial love that caused him to endure the whipping post where the cat of nine tails, this leather strap braided with nails, broken bits of glass, shards of pottery and anything else sharp they could find. Would, would wrap around him and they would throw it and it would wrap around him and they would yank it as his flesh began to rip off his skin. And this is how we're supposed to love our wives. And it was sacrificial love that took him to the cross as he began to stand, to hang there, suspended between heaven and earth uh, as he's dying. And, and you know what that was? That was sacrificial love because he loves the church so much that he's willing to get on the cross and die for you and me. Wow. Likewise, a husband must be willing without hesitation and without question to give his life for his family. At the cross, Jesus assumed the responsibility and consequences for our sinful behaviors 
even though those behaviors were not his fault. Wish I had that shovel. <laughs> Going in a little deeper. What did he do on the cross? He took our sins, right? Yes. Whose fault were those sins? Ours. They weren't his. And he had to sacrificially take upon him and suffer and sacrifice himself for something that was not his fault. Likewise, the husband must Fully assume the responsibility for the entire condition of the home. If something is wrong in the home, even if it isn't his fault, it's his responsibility. We need to esteem our wives to the point that we are willing to sacrifice what we want for their betterment. We must love our wives so much and esteem our wives so much that we are willing to sacrifice what we want so that they can be better off. Some examples of sacrificial love. Now, I haven't had to do any premarital counseling yet, so I don't know this from experience, but I've heard from great sources that oftentimes when money is talked about and the debt is talked about, oh, well, I just got a couple thousand dollars in debt. And a month into the marriage, the husband opens the bill. And realizes it's a whole lot more than a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> Sacrificial love. That wasn't your fault. But it's your responsibility now. You said I do. But why? Now we don't have any wives like this in here. The wife makes a large, uncommunicated about financial commitment that the husband knows nothing about. <laughs> Brothers, sacrificial love. And we're going to talk about submitting to your husbands next week. But brothers, <laughs> we got, we're going to have a whole lot of new cars here next week. <laughs> brothers, well, it wasn't my fault. Neither was your sin that Jesus took on the cross. But he took it anyway. Because he loved us. I told you. God ain't fair. He's just. But he ain't fair. It's Sunday afternoon. And brothers, you want a good steak. And your wife wants some frou-frou food. If you're like Jesus, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go eat some frou-frou food. And you're going to thank the Lord for it. We're laughing, but... We got to love our wives like Jesus loved us. There's... There, well... I haven't spent any time with my wife, but I'm going to go hang with the boys this week. No, you're not. You're going to spend time with your family. I'm preaching to myself. Well, I haven't, you know. 
Yeah. We got to love our wives like Jesus loved us. You want to go play some top golf, but you haven't spent any time with your wife. And your wife wants to go shopping. I can use this example because my wife doesn't like me going shopping with her. <laughs> this might change tomorrow. I'm going to go play some top golf, but you haven't had any family time. Your wife says, I want you to go shopping with me. Brothers, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use an illustration Pastor Adam said. He, he said, brothers, if you go in Dillard's, it feels like you walking in the gates of hell. You put a smile on your face. And you shop with the joy of the Lord. It ain't fair, boys. You want a new boat, but your wife wants a vacation. A sacrificial love doesn't choose my desires over the desires of my family. A sacrificial love sacrifices what I want for the betterment of my family. You see, when you're walking in that Dillard store, you know what you're doing? You're putting yourself up on the cross. Because we're willing to submit to Jesus and his will because he went to the cross for us. I promise you, brothers, if you're willing to sacrifice yourself for your wife, your wife's not going to have any problem submitting to you. Because she knows you'll take a bullet for her when, uh, when the going gets tough. And you're there for her because you're all for the betterment. You say, well, that ain't fair. Well, neither was the cross. If you don't think you want to do this, brothers, don't get married. <laughs> and if you're married, suck it up. <laughs> because the word takes preeminence over everything. Now here, this one will hit me home, okay? So I'm not taking jabs at you. Your wife wants ice cream and you want coffee? Guess where you're going? <laughs> to the ice cream shop that's closest to the coffee shop. <laughs> but we're going to go get ice cream first. <laughs> I'm going to go get ice cream. So much for honest on Sunday. Praise God. <laughs> you see, this is the only way it works if we're going to get blessed. If we're going to have the families that we're supposed to be, we got to have a revelation of sacrificial love. And again, we say it isn't fair, but, but here's the deal. And I'm not saying this to, 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 to make another point, but the cross wasn't fair. But when a husband truly lays down his self-will for his wife, she will not find it difficult to follow his lead and show appropriate respect. When a wife knows, I've said this already, but I'll say it again because it bears repeating. When a wife knows that the husband would literally take a bullet for her, it becomes easy for her to submit to him. It's, it's, it's not easy for a woman to submit to a brutish, sinful man that rules over her and tries to dominate her. Woman, you're going to do what I say. That's not the will of God. But, but when you can love your wife like Jesus loved you, I promise you, she's not, unless she's just a doozy, huh? she's not going to find uh, uh, it difficult to say, I'm behind you, I'm supporting you, I'm walking with you. So don't marry a doozy.
Put that one in your notes. Highlight it. It's important. No doozies. <laughs> I don't even know how to define a doozy. I just know they're out there. <laughs> You'll probably get in trouble, boys, when, brothers, when you do that, when you're only looking on the outside. All right. Here's how I know this works. Because it's easy for us, for the most part, to follow Jesus and do what He wants and what He requires of us because we have a revelation of the sacrifice He made for us. Does that make sense? All right. So love number one, sacrificial love. Let's move on to verse 26 and 27. Number two, type number two, love number two. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. That he might sanctify. Now this is talking about Jesus and the church here. We're talking about the church and Jesus as a model of husband and wife. Y'all with me? You following along? All right, we're walking through this together, all right? Good thing I ain't preaching on Sunday. Everybody wouldn't show up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. We're talking about Jesus in the church here, but we're going to pull this together to say what in the world does this mean to us in the family? That he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Why? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, brothers, if you're sitting to your wife, look at her and see if there's any wrinkles. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. All the women said, all right, I'm out, Pastor. What does verse number 26 mean? That he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. Well, we get initially washed. Now, we're talking spiritually in the church here, right? We're talking about the church. We get initially washed in the waters of baptism like Eric did on Sunday. He went down in the name of Jesus Christ and got his sins completely washed away. But I've been asked, well, so what do I do if I sin after I get baptized? Now what do I do? Do I got to get rebaptized? The only way you need to get rebaptized is if you've not been baptized in Jesus' name. Or if you're not sure if you've been baptized in Jesus' name. Because quite frankly, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, like, you won't go to heaven if you're not baptized in Jesus' name. That's a pretty big deal. So, the only way scripturally we see that you need to be baptized again, rebaptized, is if you were baptized wrong. But once you're baptized in Jesus' name, you move forward and you sin. Now what happens? Well, here, go back to verse 26. We see, verse 26, that he, talking about Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Here's how you get clean. Well, number one, you got to repent. But number two, you come to church. And the preaching of the word of God goes forth. And the preaching of God's word cleanses you from your sin. This is why sometimes the preaching is a little stronger than others. You ever, uh, I, uh, last night, I was, uh, we've had a, a constantly leaking toilet in our, in our guest bathroom. And so I went to Lowe's to try to figure out how to fix this and realized i never done this before, and I'm in over my head. But I'm going to try it anyway. So before it's all said and done, trying to prep for a Bible study that, uh, well, 
didn't end up happening. But anyway, trying to prep for that. I'm in the middle. At, at one point, I looked around, and I'm like, the, the, what's the back, the, the bowl, not the bowl, but the, the tank of the toilets laying on the floor. I've got pieces and tools and things strewn all throughout the bathroom, and I'm like, man, I sure hope I can get this back together. <laughs> But there was these rubber seals in that tank. And, and my hands got so nasty. At one point, my kids walked in and they're like, Dad, what's on your hands? I'm like, you don't want to know. <laughs> I didn't actually say that. I don't know what I said. But it's funny. You know what? It took a lot of scrubbing to get that stuff off. There are sometimes we come to church and it feels like, man, pastor really got the scrub brush out. He's throwing some gasoline on my hands and he's taking her because I'm trying to get that sin off of you. What happens is the preaching comes in and it cleans up the garbage that's in there. That's why we need spirit led, God anointed preaching. Because if we're going to be presented spotless and clean, we need some preaching that's going to clean us up. Hey, you know what? I don't want to live in my sin. I don't want to live Live unconvicted, but preach to me. Preach the word to me. Convict me, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes the preaching and teaching is harder than others because God is trying to get some of the nastiest stuff off of us. Why? Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle this isn't talking about physical wrinkles somebody said praise God or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish you see God wants his church to be the best and the most beautiful group of people. When you come to God and submit to his cleansing and submit to his holiness, then you will be much more beautiful than submitting to the fashions and influences of the world. Hey, I'm going to tell you, if you'll come in and you'll submit to God, you're going to be much prettier than any Kardashian could ever think to be. Hey, there's something about God and his word. He cleanses us. Because he wants us to be beautiful. You know, I, I, I've seen people. I've seen people. I, I, I've, had, I've seen stories. Uh, and and where, where somebody comes in and they're messed up. And they're dirty. And they're nasty. And they're filthy. And they're addicted. And, and you don't even recognize them. In fact, if you were to see before and after pictures uh, of, of Christian Cook who spoke to us a few weeks ago. It would blow your mind. Because when he came to God. He looks a whole lot different than he does now. He looks a whole lot better now. He looks a whole lot more handsome now. Why? Because God gets in the pretty business. He gets in the business of making things beautiful. Hey, if you don't like how you are, come to Jesus. He's going to make you better. And so this process of washing and making beautiful is called sanctification. Thus, the second type of love that a husband must have for his wife is sanctifying love. Christ's love for his bride, the church, causes her to grow in beauty and to flourish. Jesus' love lifts us up so that we can experience our full potential in God. 
Jesus isn't interested in making you live in the shallows and in the trials and in the problems for all of your life. There's going to be seasons and there's going to be trials. But guess what? When you live for God, you're going to come out of that season. When you live for God, you're going to come out on the other side. And when you come out on the other side, you're going to look better. You're going to walk straighter. You're going to talk better. You're going to act better. And you're going to have more anointing and more power. Why? Because Jesus' love for us makes us better people. This is, this is why I, I wish, I know this sounds terrible, but, and I'd probably get ridiculed for it, but, but I don't think anybody that could, would ridicule me for it is going to listen anyway. But, but this is why it's so dangerous uh, to stay in a church where the pastor beats you up uh, because you're not being able to blossom uh, into what God wants you to be. You're not going to see the fulfillment of what God wants you to be. I wish to God every person that wants to be something in God would get out of those churches uh, and go somewhere where God will allow them to be something. You know why? Because God wants you to be better. God wants you to improve. God wants you to be an overcomer. God wants you to be somebody that makes a difference. God wants you to reach your full potential. God pushes us to be better. But he also gives us everything we need to do it. He challenges us. To get better. But he supports us as we try to get better. He challenges us to improve ourselves. But he gives us the grace we need to make the improvements. And that's right. I'm still talking about marriage. Likewise. The husband should invest in his wife's potential. The husband should have a sanctifying love that if God forbid he was to ever pass off the scene, she's better off after being married to him than she was before. Too many times the husband just stifles the wife's potential because he's insecure and he doesn't want to help her. And so what happens is he bankrupts her credit and he doesn't allow her to do things and he keeps her un under this thing. And, and then if he was to die or leave or pass on or, 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 or God forbid go somewhere else and, and get a divorce and go somewhere else, she's left a pile of, of tattered ruins. But that's not the will of God. It's it's the will of God for your wife to be better now than she was when she met you. That's a sanctifying love. You got to love your wife like Jesus loves you. Hey, baby, we're going to get better. We're going to grow. We're going to reach our potential. We're going to do things in the kingdom of God together. The husband should invest in her potential as a person. As an individual, some ways that we do this is we need to support her in her pursuit of education if she so desires. We need to support her in her relationships, friendships outside the home. You don't need to, you don't need to stifle her from having friends outside the home. You need to encourage that. Encourage her to be an individual. You need to encourage her and prop her up and help her become more involved in the church. And, and we got a lot of good husbands that do that. We don't have this problem here, but we're teaching it, so we never have this problem. You know, some men, some men don't allow their wives to get involved because they know that their wife is more talented than they are. And they think it's going to make them look bad because she's doing something more. Shame on you. You should love your wife with a sanctifying love that says, hey, baby, I'm behind you 150 percent. If you outshine me, that's OK, because we're doing this together. <laughs> sanctifying love. You should support your wife in her hobbies. 
help her do her hobbies. Encourage her to get a hobby. <laughs> the husband should bring her into his world. I'm still learning this one. But the husband should ask her opinions. I don't like asking my wife's opinions. You know why? Because she's always right and it's always not what I'm going to do. But if I really love my wife, I need to ask her opinions more often. <laughs> Dave Ramsey says, every time his wife says, I don't know, it costs him $10,000. <laughs> Unless he listens to her. You know what we need to do? We, we need to have strong women and strong men in this church. Brothers, we don't need to have these these beat down ladies in here. We need to be empowering our wives. We need to empower our ladies to be what they're going to become in God and what they're going to become in the kingdom of God and what they're going to become in life. Hey, you know what? You need to encourage your wife to, to, to go out there and make some, some business deals and, and to have some, if she is so inclined to. Uh, hey, what would, what, what would it be like if your wife was bringing in on the side some extra income on some land deals and, and some of the, you know what? You know what we need to do? We need to allow our wives to do whatever they need to do to become successful in their own right and in their own way. Husbands should be so focused on helping their wives reach their potential that they should make the wives be able to be full self-supporting individuals able to stand on their own two feet. Husbands and wives should not be codependent. Codependency is not healthy. Caleb, can you come help me real quick? Now, we're not husband and wife here. <laughs> but I'm just going to illustrate you codependency because I want to go home tonight. So I'm not going to use my wife. <laughs> codependency. Codependency. I wasn't saying that to be bad. It was just, I, I love my wife, and I know she would be embarrassed if I brought her up here. So. Codependency is when I rely on this. Does that feel good? Does it feel good? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Bro, you know where liars go. Tell the truth. <laughs> it's not supposed to feel good. <laughs> what happens is, on either side, sometimes, sometimes the, 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 the man is, can't stand on his own two feet, and he gets out of mom and dad's house and marries a woman that's much smarter than he is, and he does this. He just leans on her. For everything in life. You've seen them. You know who I'm. You, you, you could probably name some names. But the other side of that is the wife does the same thing. And, and for a while, if you're a real man, this feels good. You're propping me up, man. Thank you. But if we did this for two solid weeks, you'd be miserable. Thank you. That's codependency. It's when, you know, there for a while, well, it feels good. My wife needs me. But you never encourage her to be able to, to succeed on her own. That's not healthy. What happens is men don't encourage their wives to become their own individuals because they want to manipulate her. Manipulation borders on witchcraft. And it's not godly. Codependency is not healthy. Oftentimes, men don't want to invest in their wife's potential. Again, because they want to be able to manipulate and control their wife. This isn't healthy. Because here's what happens. The strong one in the marriage begins to despise the weak one. 
Ladies, let me tell you something. Men despise anything that they can conquer. There needs to be a little something that just is never conquered. There needs to be an individuality that's never conquered. I'm my own person. You're your own person. She's her own person. We got to encourage this. I know I'm, I know I'm running against some, some countercultural things that some of y'all have known. But this is important. Because together we can take dominion. I can't take dominion by myself. And if I'm so busy trying to manipulate my wife and cause her to need me, then then I'm never going to reach my full potential. But I can reach my potential if I'll help her reach her potential. And together, we'll we'll, we'll produce some really good kids that can go, go. reach their potential and there begins to be a promulgation of of revival and and a propitiation of of, of anointing and favor and dominion and and a growth so we should never be codependent and that works either ways there should be some lines listen to me that are never crossed in marriage one example physical and verbal abuse Never. On either end of that. Wives should never pick up the frying pan and knock her husband out. (laughs) Generally, when that's going on, it's because the husband is codependent upon the wife and she's beating him into submission. It's not actually submission, it's coercion. The same is true on the other side of that. Brothers, you should never abuse your wife verbally, physically, sexually, any of the above. There are some lines that should never be crossed. We don't have this problem here, but I'm going to say it because we're, you know what we're doing in this series is putting informative things in our DNA. Listen, listen, if your husband hits you, call 911 first. You can call me after that. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. (laughs) If your husband hits you, you call 911 first, and then you can call me. Don't call me first. He just hit me. I'm going to say, have you called 911? (laughs) Because there are some lines that you don't cross. Because you know what you're doing when you hit her? You are now entering into, into a, to this type of relationship that if she doesn't stand up to you, she's going to become codependent on you, but she probably already is. And you're going to be able to manipulate her. And, and that's not the will of God. That's not the favor of God. You won't have the favor of God on your home. You won't have the blessings of God upon your marriage. Your wife's going to hate you. Your kids are going to despise you. And ultimately somebody, if not all of you, are going to be lost. Each individual should have their own voice heard in the marriage. The husband helps his wife to blossom by focusing on her strengths, not her weaknesses. We're talking about a sanctifying love. We're talking about presenting your wife to yourself. Glorious. You should help your wife. You should, you should enable her. And how do you help her? By, by focusing on her strengths, not her weaknesses. You don't have to correct her weaknesses to make her a better person. In fact, that's not even the way you, you help anybody. You strengthen their strengths. Make where they're strong. Make them stronger. God will help you fill out the rest. Think about this. God God does not correct our faults by focusing on our imperfections. Rather, He shows us what we can be and pushes us toward toward our ideal self. 
It's positive, not negative. I'm not an idiot. I know where I mess up. I don't need God to beat me over the head to tell me how wrong I am. I know I'm wrong. You know what God does instead? This is what good preaching should do. Good preaching should never beat somebody over the head and then just leave them there. Good preaching should occasionally have to point some things out. But then what they're doing as they're pointing it out, they're saying, but look, here's what you can be. Here's what you can reach for. And that's how we need to treat our wives. That's a sanctifying love. We should not subject our wife to degrading criticisms. Rather, we should speak to her potential as a person. We should speak to her potential as a person. Love number three. We're getting close to being finished. Love number three, verse number 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The third type of love that we've got to love our wives, that husbands have to love their wives with, is self-love. Self-love. Now, the self-love spoken here is not narcissism. <laughs> narcissism is one, you know, how, well, I, I don't think I know anybody that's narcissistic. All right, get on Instagram tomorrow and see who posts a selfie first. They're narcissistic. You know, narcissistic people wake up in the morning and they say, you know what the world needs of, you know what the world needs today? Needs one more selfie of me in the bathroom. You know what will change the world if I'll take one more selfie in the bathroom? That's a narcissistic person. That's not what this is talking about. You've got to have healthy self-love. If you don't love yourself, then we need to talk. Because you need to love yourself. Jesus loved you. So much so that he died for you. You should love yourself too. Healthy self-love is an awareness. An awareness of the needs and limitations of one's own body, emotions, and spirit. We intuitively or subconsciously or naturally accommodate the needs and even wants of our body. And unless we're mentally incapacitated, for instance, an example of this, unless we're mentally incapacitated, we, we, we don't have to have people remind us to eat when we're hungry. We love ourselves enough that when we're hungry, we Unless we're in a bad place mentally. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Healthy self-love is, is nobody had to tell you to get your clothes on before you walked out of the house today. <laughs> I've had to tell my kids that before. <laughs> nobody had to tell you that. Now, they might have had to tell you. Now, that doesn't match. <laughs> but they didn't have to tell you that you needed to put clothes on. So we love ourselves and, and a healthy self-love is that we, we naturally take care of the needs that we have. Likewise, men should do what they can. Or they should work, rather, to be aware of their wives and provide for them accordingly. Men, men do what they can to provide themselves as many creaturely comforts as possible. A husband should give himself to providing as many comforts to his wife as he possibly can. The minimum duty, the minimum requirement is you got to work to provide housing, food, and clothing. This is self-love. That's the minimum. Self-love is making sure 
that for sure the basics are taken care of. The essential needs are met. But brothers, there's sometimes we walk into the home, turn the key, open the door, and we realize there's trouble in paradise. <laughs> A healthy self-love <clears throat> that I need the grace of God to help me with. Because I'm, I'm clueless oftentimes to multiple things. But a healthy self-love is one in which the husband tries to determine why is there trouble and, 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 and what needs to happen to help resolve or fix or make my wife taken care of. Oftentimes... What it means for me is putting down my phone, shutting my mouth, and listening, which is way harder for me to do than it appears. <laughs> Oftentimes, my wife's not looking for me to solve a problem. She's looking for me to shut up and listen to her issues, and she'll be fine. <laughs> but me, I'm like, well, I can fix that for you, and that just makes it worse. So what we have to do is we have to love our wives as we love ourselves. We, we've got to take care of her needs intuitively. This is a self-love. This is, this is, we've got to love our wives as Jesus loved himself and loved us. This also includes figuring out what love language your wife speaks. I, I, uh, I read a book called The Noticer, and he simplifies four of the love languages, leaves one out, because Gary Chapman has a book called Five Love Languages. And, and, but, but in The Noticer, he identifies four love languages, and he, he, he identifies them as an animal. And so, so, so what you got to do is you got to figure out which animal your wife is. <laughs> is she a dog? Is she, a, is she a fish, a goldfish? Is she a cat? Or is she a canary? And your wife has to figure out what you are because you're one of those four too. You see, a dog is, is, think about a dog. A dog, how does a dog know that you love it? When you just tell it how often. Here, good puppy, good puppy. You're a good dog. You're, you might pat it on its head, but, but your, your voice talking to that dog does much more for it than the pat on the head. Here, Chance, I love you, buddy. You're doing good. They also know when you're mad at them by the tone of your voice. And so the first love language is, is, is the spoken word of affirmation. It is your wife like a dog, are you like a dog? Where, where, and for me, this is me, I'm a dog, all right? I'm a dog. Uh, tell me you love me, and, and I know you love me. Like, tell me how awesome I am, and I know you love me. Like, that's all I need. <laughs> I don't need gifts. I don't need, I don't need you to do anything for me. I, 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 I don't even need you to spend time with me. I just need you to talk to me. Tell me how awesome I am. <laughs> I mean... Look, I, I mean, a gift, like, I mean, thanks for the gift, you know, but <laughs> tell me how awesome I am when you give me the gift. That's what tells me you love. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she likes gifts. She really does. But here's, the, now that's not one of the four, okay? Gifts is kind of one he left out. I don't know why. I don't know what the animal would be for that. Maybe there's not an animal that corresponds to that. <laughs> But the second animal is, is, is a goldfish. The goldfish, it, it, it knows you love it because you clean its bowl and you feed it. The goldfish knows you love it because you get in there, you wipe down its tank, 
you, 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 you filter out the rocks and, and you feed it every morning and you don't have to pet it because good luck doing that. You don't have to talk to it. It can't hear you. You don't even have to spend time with it. You don't have to give it gifts. Just take care of it. And the goldfish knows you love it. The, the, so what you've got to do is figure out, um, do, is my wife an acts of service? Does, does she, how, does my, how can I convey to my wife in a language she understands that I love her? Is it fixing the toilet bowl? By the way, I got it fixed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> I know Brother Shup loves me. <laughs> and so, is there, a, is there a bush that your wife's been after you to trim for months and months and months? Then, then that's probably, <laughs> somebody's got to go trim a bush. <laughs> That's how your wife's going to know she, that you love her. Is you go trim that bush. The third, the third animal, and I'm trying to hurry. Well, I, I promise you I'm almost done. Uh, the third animal is a cat. The cat, you don't have to talk to it. You don't have to take care of it. It'll go, it you don't even have to feed it. It'll go kill a mouse or something. <laughs> but the cat needs you to touch it. It's going to rub your leg. It's going to need you to pet it. It's going to jump in your lap. It just needs physical touch. So, is that how your wife knows you love her? Is your wife a cat? The fourth one is canary. A canary knows you love it when you spend time with it. It just wants to sing you a song. Doesn't need you to do anything but just sit there and listen to it sing. But I've heard that if you place a canary in a room. <laughs> with a cat. How did Tweety die? But I've heard if you place a canary in a room all by itself and you don't go visit it for a number of days and you've, it's got food, it's got water, it's got all that, it's going to die. So does your wife just want you to spend quality time together? The fifth one that he didn't have an animal for is gifts. What we've got to do is we've got to determine if we really love our wives, we're going to have self-love and we're going to love her in a way that she knows that we love her. Does that make sense? Self-love. All right. I believe another, another aspect of self-love towards our wives is striving to have, and this is very, very hard in 2020, but striving to have a clear system and line of communication. Striving to communicate with your wife as much as possible. I'm not talking about her being overbearing, but I'm talking about Showing her that she is important enough for you to communicate your plans to her even when it doesn't directly affect her. I, I uh, th earlier this week, I went to Memphis. I ended up having to go to Atlanta. Uh, my, my wife, it truly didn't change anything about her for me to g fly from Memphis to Atlanta to go pick up this van. I could have just not told her. It, it literally wouldn't have changed anything about her life. But I decided, you know what? I need to call her and let her know. Besides the fact that if I die in Atlanta, she's going to wonder why I'm there. <laughs> but you know what we got to do? It lets her know that you love her when you have this open line of communication, even when it doesn't immediately impact her life. All right. Love number four, this is the last one, it's very short. Verse number 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. The fourth type of love 
is unbreakable love. Unbreakable love. When a couple is married, they become one. Legally, physically, and spiritually. And God intended this union to be permanent. Until death do us part. Both divorce and adultery are especially devastating to humans due to the fact that they tear a person's life on multiple levels. Divorce should always be the exception, and I propose that the word divorce should be a word that is never spoken because the fourth kind of love that we have is an unbreakable love. To have this kind of oneness in marriage, the couple must leave their parents and cleave to one another. This love is strengthened by going through trials and tribulations together. This love is weakened if the parents of one or both, the husband and the wife, constantly support them financially and otherwise. The love between husband and wife will become strained because it will not be allowed to grow stronger because they're depending upon someone else. But there's a strength that comes in a marriage that has to weather some storms. There's a strength that comes to marriages that can look back and say, you know what, there was a time in my life when I was working for an asphalt company and I was making $250 a week and I didn't know how I was going to pay my bill, but my wife was over in that little house in Frazier making some cakes, literally baking some cakes, some wedding cakes, and we paid the bills and we had Christmas because we walked through it together. There was only a couple times in my life that my parents or her parents helped us out a little bit here and there. But, 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 but my, my parents aren't paying my bills and her parents aren't. You know what? I can look back and, and my wife and I can look back and our love becomes unbreakable because together we walk through the hard times and together we walk through the trials and together we walk through this. And our love is unbreakable. Why don't we stand? Hey man, I've been teaching for a really, really, really long time tonight. But here's what I want us to do for probably two or three minutes. I wonder, brothers, if you can come to the front. All the brothers. I wonder if the men can come to the front. Because here's the deal. What I've been teaching tonight is heavy. It, it really is heavy. We... We cannot do this. I'm not up here preaching to you because I got this all figured out and I'm nailing it. I'm not. I've got issues of my own. Now, if you're not married, brothers, I want you to continue to pray because you need to start praying now. <laughs> Ask any of us that are married. We wish we'd have prayed a whole lot sooner. But what we're going to do is I want us to begin to pray. And ask God to give us the grace to be the men that God has called us to be and the husbands. Now, sisters, why don't you come in? Just stand behind them. You don't have to touch them unless it's your husband. <laughs> but what we want you to do is just, I want you to reach your hands out towards them. And why don't we pray? Come on, brothers, let's pray. God, I want to be the man that you want me to be. I want to be able to love my kids and my wife the way you want me to love them. Oh, God, help me. God, help me to love my family. Come on, that's it. Jesus, here I am, God. Here I am, God. Lord, help me, God. When I get a family, when I get a wife, I pray that you would help me to be what you want me to be. But even now, before I have a family, God, help me to begin to love my neighbors and begin to love my co-workers in this same manner. God, let me begin to strive to be like you and to be in your image. Oh, come on, that's it, brothers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God help us, Lord. <laughs> Woo!
Hallelujah. Why don't you for 30 seconds join up with your brother and join up with your the one standing next to you. Let's just pray for each other. God, help my brother to become everything you want him to become, God. Help him to become the man that you want him to become, God. Help him to become the leader that you want him to become, God. Give him, give him, give him a solidarity in Christ. Give him, give him the strength to be what he needs to be in Christ. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, thank you for responding to the word of the Lord. Amen. I know it is 9.14. I appreciate you listening to me. I know it was a long lesson tonight. And I apologize for going so long, but I wanted to get it off. And I tell you what, brothers, if we'll be what God's called us to be, then God will help us to become what we need to be. Amen. 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 Brother Kenny? We're doing this. That's right. That's right. Hey, love you all very much. Thank you for responding to the word of the Lord. And I pray you go out and have a blessed week. We'll see you, well, weekend, but we'll see you on Sunday. God bless you in Jesus' name.